Hello, everyone. I am here with a man who certainly needs no introduction to anybody who has seen a single puck drop uh, in New England uh, and has been in the, the Boston and New England scene for, some, for many years. So it is, uh, it is just such a delight for me to sit down. Uh, as Jack and I were talking earlier, uh, we get about a half a sentence worth of conversation between me trying to get cameras set up and things like that and him getting preparing for the game. So it's uh, very exciting for me to actually sit down one-on-one -on -one and uh, talk about uh, Jack Edwards, the man, the legend, uh, <laughs> and, and, now, uh, and now someone who's getting ready to go into probably, I, I, I don't want to speak for you, the strangest hockey playoffs uh, you've maybe ever experienced. Yeah, um, I was uh, just writing an email about this um, because the stakes are so high. Uh, Major League Soccer has, of uh, this record date, had two teams drop out of its restart tournament. And uh, because once one player on a team gets it, everybody gets it. Um, I think the Dallas team had 10 players come down with it. Uh, Nashville just had nine players test positive for it. So they withdrew from Major League Soccer's tournament. Um, you know, that's, that's important uh, in Major League Soccer context. But what happens if, say, the Pittsburgh Penguins reach the conference final and all of a sudden, eight skaters test positive. What does the NHL do then? Yeah. You know, what, what, what do they do? There's no clear plan. You know, there, there are, there's language that there are contingencies uh, to delay or cancel, but there's no firm policy out there. And, you know, you get the feeling that if the Bruins have guys like, uh, you know, I'm not devaluing them, but um, guys like uh, Jake DeBrusque and, and uh, Chris Wagner and John Moore come down with it, uh, the NHL will say, go on. But if the Pittsburgh Penguins have Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, and Chris Letang test positive, all hell's going to break loose. So, you know, what is the policy? And, and that's not clear to me yet. Your, your starting goalie goes down, you're in trouble. I mean, nothing well, against, uh, you know, any backup, but seriously. And, and yeah. everybody's health is paramount in all of this and their families and anybody else they come in contact with afterwards. It's certainly more important than the sport. But like you said, it, it'll be names like, who, who, what game am I watching if you're listening to this on the radio? Because it'll be names that they'll be asking you to put some skates on. You've got enough experience with the game. <laughs> yeah. Be ready. Yeah, and, and bring them and, with you to the ring just in case. And, and you know as well as anybody being part of our production team that that one of the most enjoyable things about the Stanley Cup playoffs and, and hockey in general is the ability to lay out and let the crowd tell the story. And that wave of sound that motivates players on both teams mm -hmm. because so many teams, especially these Boston Bruins, feed off hostile energy mm -hmm. and Good or bad. there's going <laughs> to be zero energy in the building and, yeah. and and i don't know how the players are going to react to that especially veteran players you know sedano chara has not played in front of empty seats in like 25 years and and one wonders how he is going to be able to uh, adjust, you know, I, I don't question his motivation, but, um, there's a natural rhythm to the game. And, uh, part of that rhythm is your ability to deal with it emotionally and channel that energy that comes from external sources into, uh, your, your playing effort or into your broadcasting effort. And, that's going to be a really weird thing. It's going to seem like uh, one hand clapping a lot, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I, what I would recommend when I played youth hockey and we scored a goal, 
you <laughs> lean over the boards with the stick and smash it against the board so you make as much noise as you can. I, I would recommend that the players do that. And um, I, I think you'll have to take out of your, your lexicon, if you will, uh, the crowd goes wild because you just won't, it, there may be one or two people snuck into the bleachers somehow, but it may not you know, come through the, through the broadcast. And the, the empty seats express no emotion. Right? <laughs> Doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? <laughs> not quite, not quite. And just a year ago, you and I were on the Nesson stage and I described it to people who weren't there. It was like Woodstock. It was yeah. just, you know, packed with people, black and gold, um, it, you know, it, and you were getting ready for the broadcast and it was just a, you know, a fun party scene that, that is, you know, being removed from the game, which is a shame. So I, I just wish everybody in the sport, you know, every, the, the absolute best. Yeah. Um, th this is, this is such a weird time, isn't it? Because, um, you, you are jonesing for what was normal, but every time we see photos of people uh, closely mingled in a bar or at the beach or look through photographs of, of uh, concerts we've been to, mm -hmm. you think the first thing that goes through your head is super spreader event, yeah. you know? And, and, and I, uh, <laughs> my mother's gonna turn 92 next month. She lives three and a half miles away. Good for um, her. She's, she's not in the best of health, so we're seeing her like two times, three times a day. Everybody in my nuclear family is going to visit her on a regular basis. So, <laughs> you know, we're being super careful. And every time our Venn diagram intersects with anybody else's Venn diagram, uh, we're really careful about, you know, that person's exposure to my mother. And something that tends to get overlooked when we talk about sports resuming is all the other people that the athletes and coaches and staff members are necessarily going to be in touch with if they're not living in a hermetically sealed bubble. And, you know, so far, the uh, Major League Soccer experiment is not going well. Yeah. <laughs> They're living in a bubble, and yep. two teams have dropped out. So, yeah, you know, this is nothing to be uh, poo-pooed about. Now, talking about proximity, uh, we're used to seeing you and Andy Brickley literally shoulder to shoulder. Is there going to be another piece of glass put up between the two of you? And yeah. you must communicate in between periods. Are you going to put little notes up against the window? So don't forget to talk about so-and-so. I mean, how are you going to pull that off? Or do you, have you even I, heard? I, I think uh, uh, Brick has, has been wishing for this for years. <laughs> 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 but uh, we're going to be six feet separated. Mm -hmm. uh, I... Uh, I think I'm going to uh, learn of the uh, exact protocols in the next few days. But uh, yeah, I think there's going to be a plexiglass barrier. And, you know, it, it, Nesson has, has rearranged the HVAC uh, to the rooms where personnel are going to be uh, working. So, you know, God bless him for, <laughs> for oh, yeah. doing uh, physical improvements to the building while no income is <laughs> yeah. getting generated. Um, you know, I, I cannot say enough good things about Nesson's top level management um, <laughs> because I know a lot of C-level executives um, through my, uh, my family connections and uh, they are cutting and slashing and burning and Nesson has held the line so far. And that is incredible because, <laughs> you know, the Bruins vanished and then the Red Sox vanished and the revenue streams have evaporated. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like Nesson can go to a talk show format, you know, that's, 
<laughs> that's not Nesson's bread and butter, you know, and sure. it's just, uh, it's remarkable. Um, and, and, and I think too, from the fan standpoint, we can only, and, and they, Nesson is a great company to work with. I'm, I'm proud to work alongside of them as well. Um, but you know, the fans can only watch so many top 10 shows, you know, <laughs> you, you're digging for, you know, uh, information that, you know, thank God that Tom Brady made the announcement when he did. And then they waited, you know, I jokingly said with Gary Tangway, did you ask Gronk to wait two weeks before he announced he was going to join Brady? So you had something else, something different you could talk to. And, and, you know, so the topics have been a little thin, but you guys have, have soldiered on. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, it's the weirdest time I've ever lived through, but, uh, Thankfully, knock on wood, um, it hasn't, uh, hasn't affected anybody in my immediate family. Excellent. Excellent. Well, wish you, your mother a happy birthday when it comes along and all the best to <laughs> her and all of you. Um, looking at, um, I, and this is almost irresponsible of me, one of the funnest things about working with you, and, and I, I know you've heard this before, whenever I ask people, we're supposed to, I should have done a sound check right off the top of this. Because when I ask people, I put a microphone on them and I ask them to do a sound check. They do testing one, two, three, four, and this droll little voice that isn't the one they're going to use. But I'm like, okay, at least I know I have audio coming through. So Jack, would you do one of your Jack Edwards audio test if I asked you to test your microphone? Yeah. Outlined against a blue gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. In dramatic lore, their names were famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. These are only aliases. Their real names are Stuhlger, Miller, Crowley, and Layden. And Grantland Rice went on to, you know, write the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse in uh, Notre Dame's epic win over Army at the Polo Grounds. The uh, final score to that game, I believe, was 13 to 7. And, you know, <laughs> Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, you know, it's, it's recalling something like uh, the, the uh, 73 to zero uh, NFL championship game in days of yore, but it was 13 to seven. But um, yeah, I, I, uh, I started that because um, I read uh, Harry Reister's autobiography before the colors fade. And uh, I, I picked up a couple of things from that book, uh, one of which was when he was um, going to a news event, uh, he would bring an unlined um, sheaf of papers. And he didn't want to restrict his note taking to anything, to even lines on a paper. Uh, and so I started doing that and I realized that you could organize your notes in unconventional fashion if unconventional things happen. Um, the other was that uh, Harry Reasoner, instead of doing one, two, three, four, used to recite the preamble to the Constitution. So, uh, you know, we the people. And, and uh, the so I, I decided to do something on, uh, on the sports uh, side of it. So uh, a nod posthumously to uh, Harry Reasoner, who was a great, great reporter. Okay. Well, well, thank you for your audio test. They're always, I stop on my tracks. I listen like I've never heard it before, but I'm like, oh, that, now that's Jack. We're working with Jack today. That's a good thing. That's good. So thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, speaking of preparation, what um, – I, as I say about athletes, we sit on our couch and we're couch coaches and we tell you what he did wrong. What was he thinking? And good or bad, we see their performances, but we don't see the other million hours that goes into preparing for each, each game. What, what is your, do you have a typical kind of day that you do, you know, pregame and, and what do you do? What are the things that you do every time or, or, you know, depending on the team or whatever that you do to prepare for games? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, a, a man of systems and uh, I believe in systems. I trust the systems and I've got a ritual that's virtually to the minute on game days. Um, and uh, it basically is, I wake up, download a 
pant load of data, uh, which I've, I've created a system where it, it used to be I'd have to search and fetch the uh, data, and now I've got a system that's semi-automated. It takes me about half an hour. It used to take me two and a half hours. So that's really good that I can do less clerical work. Um, and then I, uh, I analyze the data, uh, individualize it by every eligible skater and goalie uh, for that night's games, um, then review what's gone on in the league uh, since I went to sleep. Sure. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and uh, then I specifically study uh, that game tonight, uh, look at the team trends, uh, look at who's hot, who's not, injury histories. Um, if I have time, uh, fight histories that are getting more seldom, but, um, uh, and uh, then uh, depending on the circumstances, I may go to the morning skate. I used to go to every single morning skate, but um, they, over the last few years have become more and more uh, mass media oriented uh, press conference type meetings um, and less informative, less intimate. Uh, morning skates used to be just a, a, a great place to gather nuggets and some still are. Uh, and that's why I say, depending on circumstances, um, but a lot of teams travel with giant media contingents now, and uh, you just can't get to the players individually. So um, it's kind of a waste of time compared to other uh, methods. Then in the early afternoon, I have a good lunch, work out to get oxygen into my brain and uh, to get away from the game. Then I study video. Uh, check my charts on every individual player, check my charts on the team, pack up the computer, go to the venue, reassemble the computer, make sure it works, and uh, then we're into pre-production. And uh, meanwhile, you know, I've, I've been back and forth with, with uh, Brian Zicello, our producer, Rose Meraki and Wheeler, our director, uh, Sophia Yerkstevich, our uh, reporter, and, and of course, Brick, um, keeping apprised of, of what they know and what their feelings are about that evening's telecast. And, and I, have to, I have to imagine that the exponential growth of technology provides you, you know, our toothbrushes are now high def. I mean, it gives you <laughs> access to information that when we all first started, you had to get a piece of paper or a newspaper or something like that. I imagine it makes your life easier. Yeah. Um, it's easier now that I've, I've learned to manage it. Um, mm -hmm. Steve, before I got a handle on it, um, it overwhelmed me and I, I couldn't cut it off. And I, I reached the point about six or seven years ago where I just, shut it down and I figured if anything massive happens somebody will let me know <laughs> but but I I shut off the media at about four o'clock and uh for a seven o'clock game because it's it the information age is a double-edged sword uh one side of it is you have access to billions of data points uh the uh downside of it is you're curious what the billion and first data point is so you know you I, it took me a long time to to manage it and um having started in uh, radio news and and radio sports um i'm kind of uh an infoholic so um you know my pursuit of new information is always a priority and i i realized that it was getting in the way of my game prep so okay. um yeah it, it took me a long time you know probably 15 years of of 
better and better and faster and faster uh, internet and uh, to, to say, you know, there's a limit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just one drink at the bar instead of 17. <laughs> you know? Excellent. The, uh, now you've been working with Andy Brickley for some years, so you guys have, have it down. How much uh, pregame prep do you guys usually take? And do you, do you decide period by period? Uh, how do you decide what topics you're going to, in between the downtimes that you're going to discuss or who you're going to talk about? <laughs> if I ever get around to writing my autobiography, at least one fat chapter is going to be about Andy Brickley. Um, I have worked with well over a hundred analysts in my career. Mm -hmm. um, he is easily the, the most insightful, quick thinking, uh, uh, analytical, uh, master of language that I have ever dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, He's, he's like a cat that gets thrown out of a window and always lands on its feet. <laughs> no, no matter how rocky or steep the terrain may be, because Lord knows what's going to come out of my mouth every time I inhale, right? <laughs> I don't even know. I, I, I sometimes watch air checks and say, did I really say that? <laughs> You know, you know, it's hockey. It's, it, yeah. there are a lot of random events, but, um, uh, I, I have had many experiences, uh, in my broadcasting career and some analysts really, really want to know everything. So they're never surprised. Hmm. Rick is the absolute opposite of that. Um, the genesis of, of this attitude that we've taken, I, I know I'm burying the lead, but uh, the genesis of, of this uh, attitude that we've taken uh, is a result of a game that Brick and I worked together for the Versus Network, which was uh, the evolution of the Outdoor Life Network, which became NBC Sports Network, um, just when Versus had secured the NHL rights. Uh, it was a game in Minnesota, in St. Paul, and the producer had us rehearse the Open seven times. And it got to the point where um, we were trying to remember the exact wording of what we had said in previous rehearsals. And we went on the air, and the open sucked. Yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> terrible. And, and it sounded as if we were like first graders at a school play trying <laughs> to remember our lines, and especially me. And, and the game, you know, we did the telecast, and the game ended, and we walked out of the booth, and we took a couple of strides in silence, and Brick turned to me and said, let's never rehearse again. Wow. And from that day forward, we have never, ever rehearsed anything. Producer Brian Cicello goes through the rundown with us in, in the pregame, in pre-production, and uh, explains to us what graphics we're going to see, shows the video to us, but we rehearse none of our dialogue. Wow. And sometimes I fall on my face. <laughs> Brick always lands on his feet, but it's spontaneous, energetic, and it's better for both of us. And um, so we kind of keep our distance on game days, except for essential uh, communication. But um, we've, you know, we've worked together almost 16 years now. So, awesome. yeah, it, we're, <laughs> I don't know. It's like a thousand and something games together. Sure. But uh, yeah, so so we're uh, we fit like you know an old pair of shoes. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. 
and to and even though he's done it for a, a while, as you say, um, Brick, you know his his NHL experience, both as a Bruin and, and playing for other teams, is fascinating. But I think the challenge for all of us is taking that experience and putting it to words concisely, in bite-sized bites that people who've never played hockey <clears throat> feel like they were on the ice with you, and those who you know have played uh, at a high level can sit there and say both of both of you guys know what you're talking about and that's part of the entertainment of sitting down to watch a Bruins game um, but that's fascinating to hear that the two of you are so spontaneous um, I also got to w work with Brick um, Nesson had a show on course with Andy Brickley where we'd go on a golf course won and an Emmy a different guests it won an Emmy so that was first season I said <laughs> spoiled should never get one your first season <laughs> yeah it's like having a birdie on the first hole <laughs> The rest of your round, you're, you're walking through yeah. the woods. <laughs> but uh, great fun to work with him. But he would work with Justine, the producer, and she'd say, talk about this, this, and this. Okay. Can I just talk about this? Absolutely. And, and that's probably why the show works so well. But, um, but it was great fun working with Brick. And um, I, it's, you know, it's great to see his second career, uh, to bring his knowledge and his experience and enthusiasm, because that's... That's what people, you know, that's what people enjoy. And it's the only true reality show, if you ask me. Reality shows are so overproduced, in, in my opinion, that <laughs> it's almost predictable. Whereas hockey, any sport, it's particularly hockey where it's so fast, a game, the momentum can change on one shot. That's all it takes. Yeah, and, and uh, Brick is able to... Uh, he describes it as a, a film script memory. You know, I, I don't know how much of our audience uh, is familiar with classroom film strips, but um, <laughs> back in elementary and, and middle school, which used to be called junior high, um, uh, sometimes teachers would have, uh, in essence, a, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which was, uh, a film strip which had a, a, a 33 and a third RPM record playing and that would be the narration and there would be a tone uh, to cue the teacher to wind it ahead to the next frame of the film strip and uh, so you would watch this and it was better than having your teacher lecture you about the Pythagorean theorem, so you went along with it. But, but Brick is able to uh, see a play and recall exactly the touch points that made that play happen or not happen. And he is constantly in communication with the truck while I'm calling live play-by-play, -play, and he's got one eye on what's happening in real time on the ice, and the other eye is, is kind of reviewing and talking to the truck and saying, cue that back to where Brandon Carlo administers the check in the Bruins zone. And sure enough, Patrice Bergeron's shot is a result of Brandon Carlo's check behind Tuka Rask. And, and I... You know, <clears throat> pardon me for digressing, but you know it is a uh, a video podcast, so <laughs> sure. Oh, you go right ahead. Nobody's going to tell me that that there's a, <laughs> there's a time limit. So, um, so many New Englanders have gotten to the NHL in the last ten years. It's it's really remarkable, and if you've been involved in youth hockey and you've been involved in travel hockey. Um, a player, by the time he gets to be draft age, has probably had at least 12, maybe 15 different coaches. But every single player has watched Bruins on Nesson and heard a, single, a singular voice, and that's Andy Brickley. And I, I cannot help but think that beneath the surface, beneath the radar, he has had a subliminal effect on the development of youth hockey players in New England. Because 
while they've been hearing all kinds of different systems, all kinds of different drills, all kinds of different coaching philosophies, they've heard one guy teaching them the game. And that voice is Andy Brickley. And for that alone, not to mention his, his spectacular career at UNH and his NHL career, he is one of the icons of, of hockey in New England for all time. And I think that that goes completely unappreciated. And, and I've been around some great, great hockey minds. I've been really fortunate, uh, starting with Charlie Holt, who was the legendary coach at, at the University of New Hampshire, who let me read his coaching notebook, which is wow. a personal diary. Um, and I, I learned so much uh, from him. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, so many people in the hockey community have helped me. Brick is the greatest hockey mind I've ever been around. And, uh -huh. and I, I think that really goes underappreciated. Because mm -hmm. he makes it look so easy. That's, yeah, right. And he has this information and he has an enthusiasm about it that you're not being talked down to. You're being brought along as a teammate. So that, and I also did the, uh, as I worked with you, the Bruin uh, Fan Fests, that we would do this big show would go to a city, all these things we can't do anymore, but Super they would have this. Super spreader event, right. <laughs> well, well <laughs> so not, that's not going to happen, but we went to different cities, and you and Brick individually would go to a tent, and the fans would come up, shake hands, all the things you can't do anymore, shake hands, no masks, get autographs, get a selfie, yeah. Um, yeah. and he would just, you know, I'd get some footage of that too, and just loved how, you know, people are used to seeing you guys on television. That that's you know that's the safe zone. But now they're able to stand next to you, and it's just like you know they, they don't know what to say. This is their chance, and they're like, "Can I have a picture?" Absolutely. And you guys just make them feel comfortable, like you know, just hop on the couch and let's let's watch a game together. So, so that you know, on and off the ice, he is is the same gentleman. Both of you are yeah. the same gentleman that we get to enjoy on TV. And since you digress, I need to digress for a point that I almost forgot. You were talking about the impact that fans have on a game and the Bruins I get to go not all of them but I get to go uh, do a handful of practices and the crowd that turns out for Bruins practices yeah. is you know something behold and they're cheering this is during your drills people cheer and a guy you know hits the post they're like oh you know and, and the <laughs> same effect so I, I think like you were saying before it's going to be a major in football they pipe noise into the practice stadium to get that game feeling and I think yeah. they're going to have to have headphones to experience it when there's no noise at all. Or as I said, over the boards with the stick, whack it as hard as you can. I know they're expensive, but hit them. And that, that's about as much noise as you may get to hear after a goal. Yeah, it's, it's wacky. And I, I shudder to consider this possibility, but I certainly hope that the National Hockey League doesn't do the peewee tournament thing and blow the ship's horn after every goal, uh -huh. no matter who scores it, right? Yeah. You know, it's just like that would so cheapen the event. It's if you're gonna have no fans, have no extraneous noise. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, to, to try to simulate a hockey crowd, yeah, sort of gets in the way. If, if it's gonna be bare naked hockey, let's hear the audio, you know, yeah. <laughs> Send, Send a disclaimer on the screen every 20 minutes. As Gordy Howe said, I speak two languages, English and Bulgarian, you know? So <laughs> can you imagine hearing Marshawn trash talk just before the drop of the puck? I mean, uncensored? I mean, that would, <laughs> that would be brilliant, right? It would. Mike them all. Mike every player, but particularly him. <laughs> So now, Jack, I got to put you to the test at least once. Yeah. I want to know Jack Edwards' all-time all-star team for each position and coach. Ooh. Wow. Um, so um, I, uh, I hesitate to, to do this on the philosophical uh, basis that um, – I, I will I will name a team. 
but but um, my barroom uh, suggestion is who's on your second team because okay. some of them are totally obvious. Um, but also, um, I, I use the Jesse Owens, Usain Bolt comparison. Uh, who was the greater sprinter? Well, you know, obviously in empirical measurement, Usain Bolt is a faster man than Jesse Owens ever was. But if you put Usain Bolt back in the 1930s, facing what Jesse Owens faced, not having the nutritional guidance, the coaching, the uh, facilities, uh, all that, that elite amateur, amateur athletes, and now professional, even in the Olympic athletes, um, are, are, are privy to, um, Jesse Owens probably wins that race. Uh, if you put Jesse Owens in the uh, 21st century, maybe Usain Bolt wins that race. But mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's impossible to compare Tom Brady realistically to John Elway. Because Elway got knocked down 75 times every Sunday just for the fun of knocking him down. If you <laughs> breathe on Tom Brady, there goes the flag. You know, the rules are different. And full marks to Brady for, for being the, the best uh, ever at reading coverage and knowing where receivers were going to be and putting a catchable ball in that little one square foot area. But um, to compare Sammy Baugh to John Elway to uh, Tom Brady from three different eras, it ought to be good enough for, for a player to have been the best in his era because that's all he could compete against. Sure. So, the so let me re rephrase thing. the question. Let me re rephrase the question then, make it yeah. easier for you. Who in those positions do you enjoy watching, whether they're ah. a superstar or anything else? Who do you enjoy well, and talking about? Well, um, uh, present day, I would probably go – uh, with uh, Crosby centering Ovechkin and Pasternak um, just for enjoyment factor. Uh, Sidney Crosby is, is uh, so thorough in his preparation. Uh, he's got brilliant physical skills, but it's the way he thinks the game uh, that is just astounding. Uh, he made a behind-the-back pass earlier this season, which is almost a year long now. <laughs> but uh, going forward to the goal line, a blind backhand pass that was right on the stick. And, you know, his teammate just, like, was almost embarrassed to score the goal. Like, <laughs> was celebrating the pass more than, more than that. And Ovechkin is, uh, is the greatest goal scorer of his era and may end up, if he can stay healthy and the league gets back to an 82-game schedule in time for him to uh, enjoy his, his youthful legs, <laughs> um, may pass Gretzky. You know, he's the only guy wow. who's, who's got the legitimate Henry Aaron versus Babe Ruth shot. Um, yeah. I discount Barry Bonds, who blew up like uh, somebody attached a bike pump, uh, and 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 Pasternak, Pasternak is is like the the little kid who lives down the block, who comes out and just dazzles everybody, and like you can't believe this kid is doing this stuff, and I asked him. Um, about uh, the moves he makes one-on-one -on -one, uh, during his rookie season. I, I said, do you um, do this spontaneously and just invent it on the fly? Or do you think out these moves? Um, and uh, I, I, because I, in my previous life as a reporter, once asked this of Michael Jordan. Uh, and, and Jordan said, uh, I, I kind of invented, 
in midair. And sometimes I change direction in midair, mm -hmm. which is a physical impossibility. But, but if you watch Jordan highlights, yeah. you see it. <laughs> and um, uh, Pasternak said to me, no, I think every single move through. Yeah. Hey, you know, and, and it's one thing to think of it, but it's quite another to think of it in the speed of the modern day NHL. And it's a third thing to be able to pull it off, but he does it every single game. And this guy is just, just at the beginning of his prime years. I mean, this guy could be a, a prolific history making scorer. And, you know, if he can stay healthy and if he, continues to have good line mates, um, the future is unlimited for him. Um, defensively, uh, that's really tough. I, I really enjoy uh, uh, Brent Burns, um, who's, uh, whose abilities enabled him to do almost anything for his team. Um, he played wing for Minnesota. Uh, he's been a Norris Trophy winning defenseman. Uh, they kind of have him as a freelancer, but if he uh, is to be a shutdown defenseman, he can play lockdown defense. Uh, Victor Hedman <clears throat> uh, probably also makes, makes my list um, because I think uh, JT Miller gave me a, a morning skate soundbite, uh, which was uh, when Miller was playing for uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, and uh, I said, you've played against him. Now you play with him. Uh, how do you describe Hedman? And he said, well, I'm, I'm really glad I'm on his team now because when he is on you in a corner, you remember Letterman's show? how he used to jump up against the Velcro wall, you know, <laughs> and, and he couldn't get himself unstuck. He, JT Miller said, that's what it's like to have Victor Hedman on you in a corner. Wow. And it, yeah. And, and if you look at it, Hedman is such a brilliant skater, but that almost gets overlooked by his physical prowess because he's a monster strong man. And he can envelop a player and, and guys get stuck on the Velcro wall. Um, and as for goaltenders, um, uh, boy, um, that, it is such a, a mercurial position. Um, you know, I'm, I'm torn between two guys I've seen a lot. Um, uh, Tuka Rask is, is just uh, a marvel of consistency and the only thing he has not done is to win a Stanley Cup and, and uh, <laughs> get over it people um, but on the other hand um, Carey Price 2014 uh, the Bruins had it just perfect you know they they had the team they had the president's trophy they had confidence and Carey Price just eliminated them and um you know I I know he's had a couple of up and down years but look who's playing in front of him you know that's a decor that that is really really young uh I still believe that Price is going to win a Stanley Cup before he hangs it up I hope it's not with Montreal, <laughs> but, but um, <clears throat> yeah, those, those two guys flip a coin. The, uh, as a matter of fact, when I was shooting uh, on course with Danny Brickley, he had the Pittsburgh Penguins coach as one of his guests because he has Massachusetts Sully. connections. Sully, what a great guy. He, he could drive a, a ball that was like, can anybody track this thing? Unbelievable Nicest guy athlete. in the world. Unbelievable yeah. athlete. Yeah. And, and first drive, Brick said, uh-oh, I got my workout out for me. And Brick can play golf. He is a golfer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but Coach Gully said about uh, he could get a call 
uh, about Cro from Crosby any hour of the day or night. And he'll, he'll say, I, I coach, yeah, listen, I was watching this other game. And did you see this move? And he will break down the play or he'll have a thought. I'm thinking we should try something like this and practice. What do you think? And he said, he is such a student of the game. He's, yeah. and, which is like you were saying, that's what makes him so effective, makes him the best, makes him such a great leader uh, for the Penguins organization that he, he couldn't say enough nice things about him. Just how every day, every moment, he is just so present in the game. And, and uh, we have to give at least an honorable mention to Tim Thomas, who, you know, just flipped on his head back when they did. And not to take anything away from Tuca. I, I just love Tuca's approach. Um, I loved watching him play. But um, his, uh, you know, his performance and then, of course, capping it off, winning the Stanley Cup, um, you know, was I, I, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but it never gets tired uh, for all the fanfare and just – the excitement of, of being in the hunt and then winning the big game. Yeah. Well, you know, Tim, uh, <laughs> it's that, that guy is in his own orbit and mm -hmm. uh, God bless him for it. Um, he, uh, well, when it came time to uh, pick the all time Bruins fantasy team, uh, the first, first goalie chosen by me was Tim Thomas. And, and if you're talking about uh, greatest Bruins goalies of all time, I, I think he's it. And, um, you know, I, Timmy uh, came to the Bruins really far into his career. Um, Mike O'Connell was the general manager. And I recall uh, the Bruins, I think we opened it at Tampa Bay. And uh, back in the day, uh, we used to stay in St. Petersburg, which was a long way from the arena, uh, which is over in Tampa Channel side. Um, and uh, I was walking through the hotel uh, with OC, who's a tremendous guy. Um, and he said, I, I just signed a goalie because Andrew Raycroft was holding out. And um, OC said, I, I just signed a guy as an insurance policy. Uh, he was the uh, Finnish goalie of the year, a guy named Tim Thomas. And I sort of shrugged it off. <laughs> Good signing. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Jack, thank you so much for sitting down. It was great fun having to be able to put three and four sentences together with you. I mean, it's so, so, you know, not what we usually get to do, certainly not on game day. Best of luck to you. Again, a happy birthday to your mother uh, next month. You can wish it to her today if you'd like from all of us. Uh, but best of luck. Uh, I, I hope the playoffs happen. I hope, I know you and Brick will make it as much fun as possible for those of us watching the game. And uh, best of luck with everything, Jack. Well, thanks, Steve. You're a great pro and a good friend. Thanks.